This informational text is a science book. It's called Seaside Scientist. It was written by Mick Manning, and his collaborator was the artist Britta Granström. This is part two. The second half continued from part one. Here are the seven topics covered in part two. Beach detective, flotsam and jetsam, under the water, mermaids and pirates, seaside safety, very important, pollution is rubbish, seaside senses, and as an extra, useful words. Beach detective. Left, left side of the page first. Animals, including people, leave signs behind on the beach. Footprints, beak marks, food remains. Try and work out who has been out and about on your beach by studying the clues. Look at these examples first to get you started. Here's an illustration of a gull stealing an ice cream cone. So let's look here. The ice cream cone was left. Here a waiter has been poking its beak in the sand. Here someone's been collecting driftwood and sawing it up, leaving some pieces behind. And here when animal what animal has walked along here and left more than just footprints? Wow, looks like a fox that left its droppings behind. All of these scenes give us clues, if we look at them, of what or who has been on the beach. This section is called Preserving Footprints. You can make a cast of some good clear prints you found on the beach or in some mud. You need paper clips, a long strip of card, card stock paper, plaster of Paris, some rubber gloves, a plastic bowl or bucket, and some clean fresh water. And an older brother or sister or an adult would be a good idea. Here's the steps. Number one, find some good clear prints. Circle the card stock around them and clip it together. Push the card down a bit into the sand. Step two. Wearing rubber gloves, put the plaster Paris in the bowl and stir in water until the mixture is like yogurt. Carefully pour this into the card circle that you made in step one. Step three. Wait about 30 minutes, half an hour, until the plaster is dry. Remove the card and lift out your cast. Take it home to add to your collection. Wow. Here is one of those shark bite comments, just like in part one. Prehistoric human footprints have been found on some beaches. The mud they were made in has now turned to stone. And then this last section on the bottom of the page, a giant bird. Step one. Cut out some webbed feet, like the one below, from thick cardstock or cardboard, or get a grown-up to cut you some from plywood even. Add straps to tie them to your feet and go off to find some sand. A couple holes in the cardboard make you able to put a rope through there. Now you can make scary giant seabird footprints like these footprints over here, except much bigger. This very busy double page is called flotsam and jetsam, two fancy words. And we will look at the top half of this page first. All the different things washed up at the seaside are called flotsam. Flotsam that has been thrown from a boat is called jetsam. Some people spend hours beachcombing, looking for interesting things that are washed up. Fossils, shells, wooden boxes, treasure. So let's look at one of those things might be. A seabird feather, like this one. 
a seabird's skull. This one is from a tern, one of those shorebirds. This one is a fossil of an ancient sea creature. This one is called a mermaid's purse. It's the egg case of a dogfish. This one is called the test, really the skeleton, of a heart urchin, or what's called a sea potato. This one, seaweed holdfast, is quite a long one. This one is shells. This little bit of found material, plant material, is bladenrack, seaweed. The air bladders help to keep it afloat, and you can squeeze them and pop them. This is a piece of driftwood that's been eaten by shipworms. This is nylon rope. That had to be jetsam thrown off a boat or lost from a boat. This is the skeleton of a cuttlefish, a close cousin of a squid. These are bits of crockery, bottles, tiles. All the edges have been smoothed by the sea. That was jetsam too, probably. And this is knotted rack. Its yellow fruit will grow into new seaweed. There's the fruit on it. And here is a little bit of related stuff in the shark bite factoid. Shipworm is a sort of shellfish that burrows into wet wood. It could cause the wooden ships of the past to fall apart. Down here, there's the last little section that says, make a display. Have you been beachcombing? Choose a clean beach and be careful. Don't pick up broken glass, odd syringes, oh no, don't do that, or dirty rubbish. But what you do pick up, like these things, you could make a display of your finds and show them to friends or classmates. Now the second part of the page is down here at the bottom. And the big, the big uh, title says, Maggot Pie. Hmm. It's not just us combing the beach. So are lots of animals, but they are searching for food. Nothing is wasted. A dead animal is food for maggots. The maggots are food for larger animals. This linked feeding relationship is called a food chain. Make a maggot pie. Now, who would like to cut it? So these illustrations are an example of that food chain. Rotting seaweed eaten by sand hoppers and the maggots of sand flies. That's this stuff. Here is a dead fish being eaten, guzzled by gulls. The seagulls here are eating the dead fish. Down here, a sand hopper and some maggots are being munched by birds. So, maggot pie. Mmm. It's not just us combing the beach. So are lots of animals. But they are searching for food. Nothing is wasted. A dead animal is food for maggots. The maggots are food for larger animals. This linked feeding relationship is called a food chain. Make a maggot pie. Now, who would like to eat it? Here are the steps. One, choose a smooth piece of driftwood or cardboard as a backing. Two, stick lumps of paper soaked in Elmer's glue together on the backing. Push in some feathers, let it dry. Step three, paint the paper mound pink, this part. When this is dry, spread some more glue over it, school glue, and scatter on some dried rice. So step four, imagine this is the carcass of a dead bird on the beach. You've made a really yummy maggot pie for a fox or a gull or another scavenger to come and eat. Under the water. When the tide goes out, pools of water are left behind in the sand and rocks. 
They create a special habitat for many animals, which is fun to explore. But never go rock pooling without asking an adult first. Starfish, like this one, use their tentacle arms to squeeze open and eat shellfish. Brittle starfish, like this one, um, catch food particles in their waving arms. Here is a hermit crab. Hermit crabs borrow empty seashells to live in. Here, crabs feed on dead animals. Eels, this long fish is an eel. Eels hide under rocks and hunt at night. This one is a prawn, a kind of a shrimp. Prawns are scavengers. Seaweed, like this big piece of seaweed here. Seaweed provides food and shelter. Shannies peep out from the seaweed they hide in. Gobies feed on small shellfish, like barnacles. Lobsters use their huge claws to crush food and keep danger away. So all of that is going on under the water. Here on the bottom half of this page, there's some information about how to make an aquarium. Seawater animals can't live in an ordinary fish tank, so don't take them home. Try making this instead. It's easier and there's nothing to feed. Step one, cut the top off of a cardboard box and make two windows, front and back. Step two, paint the box sea blue inside. Tape a sheet of bubble wrap over the back window. Step three, draw and cut out some sea um, creatures. Hang them from sticks that are a little longer than the box. Step four, add strips of sea colored bin liner or tissue paper to the sticks so they hang down like seaweed. Step five. Now when it's drafty or you give the sticks a shake, the animals will swim around in your aquarium. You can pretend that it's a real aquarium and have fun. Can't talk about the sea without mentioning mermaids and pirates. Long before anyone went to the seaside on holiday, Fishermen lived by the sea and survived by catching and selling fish. Other people sailed boats and ships to trade with faraway countries. They faced many dangers and a few mysteries on the high seas. Those mysteries sometimes became fishy tales, tales like stories. Many sailors said they had seen mermaids and mermen with long hair and fishy tales. These were really fishy tales, inspired by the seals who swam around the fishing boats. People from the sea. You can be a mermaid or a merman. Ask a friend to help you make your tale. First, wear a pink or silvery t-shirt and then put bubble wrap around your legs and fasten it with packing tape. Make sure you can still move. Shape the foot of the wrap into the tail fins. Second, decorate your tail with glitter and other sparkly things so it looks scaly. And third, make yourself a seaweed wig and a beard if you want with colored tissue paper, like this beard and this fancy hair for the merman. Sea monsters. Sailors thought the sea was full of monsters. We still hunt for the Loch Ness Monster today in Scotland. Draw your own sea monster. How scary can you make it? And then another thing that people talk about in connection with the sea is a treasure map. Pirates weren't just fishermen's tales. They were real. They robbed ships of their precious cargo. Many pirates buried their treasure on secret islands far out at sea. 
Invite your friends to a treasure hunt party. Here's how you do it in three steps. One, first, choose your island. It could be a room in your house or a back garden. Draw a map of your island showing useful landmarks like pieces of furniture, doors, or paths. Step two, bury or hide some treasure, things like small toys or sweets, at different places on your island. Mark where you hide each thing on the map. Maybe add a key. For example, X equals treasure. Step three. Now, put on your pirate clothes. Hoist the Jolly Roger. That's the skull and crossbones flag. Give your friends your map and let the treasure hunt begin. So here's bedroom island treasure. Look under bed for a clue. Follow your nose, swivel twice. Lots of fun making your own treasure maps. A very important part of learning about the seaside is learning seaside safety, do's and don'ts. Sharks are magnificent and some types can be dangerous when they think swimmers are tasty seal pups. But sharks are rare. There are a lot of other seaside dangers you should be much more careful about. Let's go through the list of do's and don'ts. Don't climb on cliffs or explore caves without an adult to supervise you. And even more importantly, get an adult who knows about things like coves or caves before you enter them. Don't swim unless you're with an adult and don't try and dodge big waves as they break on the beach. They could sweep you away. See the shark bite for more advice about safe swimming. Let's do that right now. Here's the shark bite way over here in the corner. It says, many beaches fly special flags to show if it is safe to swim there. If a red flag is flying, it means it's dangerous. Don't swim. So watch out for those red flags. And if you see one, the sign means do not swim on this beach this day, not until the flag changes. Let's go back to our do's or don'ts. Here we are. Look out for stinging jellyfish and other poisonous beasties, such as weaver fish. Wash your hands after day on the beach. Microscopic germs love to live in the sand and seawater at the seaside. Shipwreck in a jam jar. Let's do that. All the way across the bottom here is that information. Shipwreck in a jam jar. If you ever use a boat at the seaside, you have to be extra careful. Sailors can drown if their ship hits rocks in stormy weather. Once a ship is wrecked, it slowly rots and sea animals and plants move in. You can make your own shipwreck in a jam jar. Step one. Find an old jar from jam or jelly and a matchbox that's small enough to fit inside the jar. Step two, make the matchbox tray into a boat using a match for a mast and a paper sail. Stick the mast up with a lump of plasticine or blue tack. Paint the boat with FEA glue and let it dry. Step three, stick the boat at the bottom of the jar with more plasticine or blue tack. Step four, add some sand and pebbles around it and fill the jar with clean water. Last one, step five. Now you have a seaside souvenir, a variation on a ship in a bottle, except you built a shipwreck in a bottle underneath real water. How long will your ship last at the bottom of the sea? Hmm. And here's the last part of the page. This is all about To the Lighthouse. Lighthouses shine out over the sea and warn sailors of dangerous, rocky places. Make your own with a small torch and cardboard tube. A crisp tube is perfect, the kind that um, Pringles come in. Make sure the torch fits inside the tube. Here are the steps. First step, 
Make a rocky base for your lighthouse from plasticine and surround it with a stormy sea made of scrunched up tissue paper. Second step, paint the um, canister, like the one from potato chips, red and stick a white strip around its center. So it's red and white. Those are the traditional colors. Three, switch on the torch, the flashlight, and slip it upright into the tube. Put a clear plastic cup on top of the lighthouse and attach it on one side so you can still take the torch out to switch your lighthouse on and off. So here's like a clear cup. And if you have the light inside, it can blink on and off. The last page is all about seaside senses. Here's a poem from John Maysfield. I must go down to the seas again, to the lonely sea and the sky. There's so much to see. For hundreds of years, artists, writers, and musicians have been inspired by the sea. You can write a poem about the things you see at the seaside. What other senses could you use to describe them? Make a rhythm as you sing or speak your poem by clacking two pebbles together. There's so much to hear. Listen to the sea and the sounds on the beach. Make a list of what you hear. Here are some ideas. The small waves going splash, splish. The big waves going boom, crash. The gulls overhead. The seaweed, pop, pop, pop. Pebble music. Plip, plop, plop. Lob a handful of small pebbles into the water. What do you hear? Listen how the pebble music changes if you use different sizes or throw lots or just a few in at once or lob them higher or lower. If you find a flat stone, try and skim it over the surface. How many skims can you do going skip, 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 skip across the water? And what noise does it make as it bounces across the water? So there's things to see, there's things to hear, like music. There are things to touch, too. Collect some seaside objects like smooth pebbles, shells, and rubbery seaweed. Sit down in a group in a quiet place. Close your eyes and pass your objects around. Don't look. Just enjoy their lovely shapes and textures. Oh, this boy's peeking. And even smell and taste. You have to be careful, though. One of the first things you notice when you arrive at the sea is the damp, salty smell. You can almost taste it on your tongue. You can find seaside tastes and smells at the supermarket. Next time you're shopping, there are spot foods that come from the sea. Things like frozen prawns, those special shrimp, fish, sea salt, dried seaweed. Buy some to smell and taste. Write down a list of all the things you see in your notebook and then make a seafood menu. Show it around and see what people like the best. This will be different if you're in the Chesapeake Bay area than it will be if you're in Pensacola on the Gulf of Mexico or if you're up in Seattle on the Pacific Ocean. But wherever you go to the ocean, next time, make sure that you have as much fun as you can by keeping your eyes and ears open and then smelling and touching and seeing what's there to explore. This is the end of part two, and that means it's the end of the book, the end. And the last part that's included in our book, Seaside Scientists, is a glossary. Glossary is the fancy way to say useful words. And we've used all of these, coal, driftwood, dunes, electricity, erode, food chain, force, gravity, mortar, pollution, rock pools, sandstone, scavenger, sewage, shellfish, tide, UV rays, ultraviolet rays, volcanic rock. And if you're not able to remember, what did I learn about UV rays? It'll say right here, page 15 is where you can find out. 
If you can't remember anything about mortar, it has a page for you to go back to, page seven in part one. Seaside scientist. You can be a young scientist next time you go to the beach. That's the end of part two and the end of the book. Informational text and a science book called Seaside Scientist. This book was written by Mick Manning, and his friend and collaborator did all the illustrations and drawings, Britta Granstrom.